Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have on for the third time, Tom Bauer. Tom Bauer's been on before to talk about NIL, talk about AAU, and now he's back a year and a half later to talk about the updates in the NIL world. If you don't know what NIL is, it means name, image, and likeness, and it's a way that payers can get paid in college through endorsement deals, through collectives, uh, et cetera. So Tom comes in to give us updates on this world. We talk about um, how to find an agent, what to talk to uh, when you talk to a college coach uh, on a visit. You know, When do you bring up NIL? Mistakes that were made. Do you need a lawyer for certain deals? Uh, how do you find an agent? Um, Jeff Shepard, Reed Shepard, what's going on at UK, and much, much more. So excited to have Tom back. He's been back three times because he's so knowledgeable on subjects that I think you guys are going to really appreciate. Um, and like I said, we go back to Kentucky. Uh, he and I were, he was, when I was an assistant or a JV coach um, at Lexington Christian Academy, he was my assistant and we were both varsity assistants. So we go way back. We've got a lot of similar um, ways of thinking about basketball, sports, education, grit. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have him back on. So enjoy the podcast and uh, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Hey, glad to be here, Corey, as always. You know, you're the uh, only person so far to appear twice, so uh, uh, that's a true honor. And um, <laughs> once again, for those that don't know, Tom is the reason this podcast even exists. And Tom and I used to coach together back in the day, back in Kentucky, so it's good to have Tom on again to do NIL Part 2. So Tom was on about a year and a half ago and was given the um, kind of the overview of the NIL world, and so much has changed since then. That episode was very, very popular. I've had a lot of people reach out to me about it. So I wanted to get Tom back on to kind of discuss the options. So let's start, Tom. In this past year and a half, uh, since we last talked, um, it's now January or February 2024. How has the NIL landscape changed? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you, you could call me this afternoon and I'd have maybe a different perspective. Um, it, it seems to you know, ch change daily, hourly. Um, it's a ever changing world. I would say when we talked last, it was an infant. Now it's uh, like a toddler. You know, it's it's getting there. It's growing up. Um, you know, from th there's kind of three different aspects. Really, there's the athletes, there's the universities, there's the um, businesses that would be involved in it as well. And you know, from that from the athlete side, um, I think more and more are starting to grasp what's going on um, and understanding the different things that need to happen in regards to their social media, their community impact, different things to try to garner deals and increase their value. I think they're, you know, that's really coming around from the university standpoint. Um, it was in some places it was slow starting because um, it was brand new and um, seemingly uh, thrust upon the universities uh, quickly. And so, and, and those are not uh, necessarily nimble ships that can change course very quickly. And so, um, but you're seeing that they're um, adding staff, dedicating staff members directly towards NIL, making sure their athletes are taken care of, making sure that um, they can do all that they can do um, to protect athletes and, and have a good NIL program at their university. From the business standpoint, that continues to grow. Um, we were early. Uh, our organization was in regards to garnering um, substantial NIL deals for uh, athletes that we were working with at the time. and. Um, at the time, it was kind of a, a leap of faith on their part. Um, now, after you know this has been going on for a couple of years, there are numbers that can show ROI um, and can show uh, the, what the businesses are getting in return. And so we're starting to see them move marketing dollars instead of it maybe just being a, um, a fan of a university that owns a business that wants to take a chance on something. You're starting to see businesses of all sizes get involved with this because it's good. It, it can be a good marketing spin when done properly. And they're going to spend those dollars somewhere on marketing anyways. And so when done properly, NIL is really giving businesses a good ROI on their marketing dollar. And so it's all growing. Again, it's still in a very early stage, given the fact that this is going to be here. This is here now. 
And so we're at the beginning of it, but, um, but everything is growing and progressing. And, and um, at the end of the day, it, it seems to be trending towards um, the athletes really being able to win um, and, you know, be in a good situation themselves. Gotcha. And thank you for, thank you for filling us in on that. You know, our audience on this, Tom, are, are high school players, their parents, college players, their parents, people that really love this niche of basketball. And what this is going to kind of do is just give them the information they need to potentially you know, use it at their prep school, making a college decision. Um, what's an example where players and families make mistakes? And like, do you have an example where a player has gotten ripped off or almost got ripped off? And if so, yeah, like, what is that that people need to look out for? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, so, look at the fine print um, in any type of deal um, that you might be uh, that an athlete might be looking at doing. Um, typically, uh, so our, we we have attorneys that review all uh, of the deals. We've seen many of them. We've seen many that um, you know most of them are above board and very simple. We do see more than what we'd like to see um, on deals that I would I would call predatory. Um, typically, those have to do with um, mass marketing type of deals where the, um, the money's not great. And you can kind of tell that they're reaching out to just a ton of different athletes. But in certain situations, there are um, perpetuity clauses. There are that, that basically what that means is that in certain instances that we've seen, if you sign this deal, um, then that company has access to utilize your name, image, and likeness in perpetuity. So if an athlete um, goes to college, they might be a freshman in college and wanting to do an NIL deal. If that athlete goes on to be somebody of a um, prominent stature, um, 10 years later, that same company that gave them a deal as a freshman could throw their face on a billboard um, because of something that they signed um, early on and not have to pay them any more money. They, they would still, it's all based on that original deal. So the biggest advice that I can give is any deal that you have, I would have an attorney review it um, just to explain exactly what's in it. Again, most of them are very simple. However, we've seen some, um, especially the, some sons of some very high profile athletes, um, surprisingly businesses try to throw in different clauses um, that if, if they were unchecked could lend to, towards some serious problems uh, in the future with no recourse, the athlete could have no recourse at that point. Can you get any lawyer to review this or do you need one that specifically knows the NIL world? For most of these deals, any, any attorney would be able to explain what's in these, uh, what's in this contract. It's just a, it, they're just standard business contracts. Um, there does have to be a quid pro quo. And so what you'd want to understand is what are you asking me to do and what am I, doing in return for you. And so that's where in that, what am I do? What am I doing in return? It, it could look like three social media posts, but then that attorney would be able to say, well, it's, it's three social media posts. Plus they own the rights to use your name, image, and likeness forever. And so that's where the meat and potatoes, of everything that you really want to get down to. Of course, there'll be things in the, in the paperwork in regards to dates on the deliverables. Um, you know, you'll need to make social media posts on this date and this date or make an appearance here at this time. Um, but that's what it comes down to is the, is that quid pro quo and getting the details on what the expectation is for the athlete. That's going to be what you really need to hone in on. And any attorney would be able to give good answers on that. If a player is looking at more complex deals, how would they go about finding a deter an attorney that specializes in NIL deals? Um, well, there, at this point, there aren't many. Um, we have multiple attorneys that work for uh, work for and with us at Athlete Advantage um, that are steeped in um, staying on the cutting edge of all the um, latest in NIL. Um, that's one of the advantages that we have to be able to look down the road and um, really understand the landscape, everything that's going on. But but truly, any contract attorney um, sh should be able to break down the very basics of what I just said, which is what are they asking me to do and what do I get in return? And it, that wouldn't have to be NIL specific. That, that would be basically any kind of business arrangement or business deal in general. Um, it would be the same sort of breakdown. It does not have to be NIL specific. Gotcha. Okay. Um, 
We've talked in the past, and you've brought up a term I've not heard before called donor fatigue. Can you explain to us what donor fatigue is as far as NIL deals go? Sure. So initially, um, what we saw, and to an extent in some places, what we still see, um, is when NIL was brand new, it was kind of an arms race of um, donors wanting to come together through collectives to um, put piles of money together to, um, you know, basically have a big pile of money that could attract athletes uh, to go to that school because those athletes could participate in business deals receiving that money. Um, we've seen some places where that's been a success. We've also seen some major, um, I, I wouldn't call them failures, but uh, it ha I don't think it's gone the way that they expected. And so donors were giving substantial amounts of money and substantial to one person, you know, it, the, the dollar amount doesn't really matter. Um, but there wasn't really an ROI because when, when somebody gives, they're thinking, um, okay, I'm going to give this large sum of money. We're going to be in the final four. We're going to win a football national championship. We're going to do all these things. And then the team goes, you know, seven and five. Um, that's happened for a couple of years now at several different places. And so that, um, that model has proven to not necessarily be the case there, um, where you can just throw money at the problem. What's also happening is, uh, and these, there's been several very high profile cases where athletes will receive um, a substantial amount of money to go to that university. Um, well, I, let me rephrase that. When they arrive at that university, they receive a substantial amount of money, um, and it doesn't work out and the athlete leaves after the next year or after that season. And so it's setting up this very interesting sort of, in some places, almost a um, mercenary type of relationship, a year by year type of contract with the transfer portal rules and different things. And, you know, obviously the donors do not like that. And so donor fatigue is basically um, collectives going to donors um, every year saying, give, just give, just give. We can't promise any type of ROI. Um, and what's setting in our donors saying, I'm not doing that anymore, or I'm not giving it this same level anymore. And so that donor based giving is, uh, is changing right before us. Whereas year one, right off the bat, it was especially at several large universities, um, an insane amount of money. And it just proved that the money alone doesn't just solve uh, the issue. All right, so I'm going to jump off topic a little bit here. If these players have been jumping from university to university, getting big paydays, in your opinion, and you might not be able to speak on this, but maybe so, does it make sense for students, athletes to become employees of the university and sign one-year contracts with them? Um, yeah, I'm going to be very careful on what I say on that. Um, but okay. you know, it, it, in an employee relationship, what you also have at that point from, from the athlete standpoint is, um, you know, if an employee shows up late to work once or twice, you can fire that employee at any given time. Um, and so it, it does open the door to some potential issues with that regard. And, and um, you know, I, we're seeing some different things, especially around the Ivy Leagues and, and different right. things where people are trying to pop up and, and make that happen. But that does open up a, a, a Pandora's box of, of different issues that can pop up from the current model. I think that the current model is actually um, the right model. It just needs to be done properly. It, there's, there's freedom for all the different parties involved with the current model. Um, it just needs to be done properly. And I think where everything has been so new, um, and it has been a race. And a lot of times when you're rushing through things, um, certain items are overlooked. Um, you're not seeing past what's initially right in front of you right now. Um, and the long-term thinking and sustainability um, is kind of thrown out the window because we have to solve this immediate problem right now because the season is coming up uh, in a couple of months. So um, I would say that you and I have, you know, a, a lot more discussions uh, in the coming year because there are going to be um, different pushes from whether it be um, looking at an employee model. Um, there are some groups that are even uh, trying to unionize. Um, and then there's the current model that we have right now. And, and, all have um, benefits and, and, you know, there are also some, you know, some things that could hurt um, the athletes as well. And, and, and full disclaimer, um, whereas it's our 
you know, it's my job and it's our job to make sure that all parties win that are involved in this situation. Our passion and where we're coming from and who our, you know, number one priority is um, are the athletes. So, so you got to understand that that's where I'm, that's yeah. where I'm coming from. It's from the athlete perspective, what would be best for the athletes? Um, Cause that's who we uh, represent and that's who we are out for out to help. Yeah. And let's talk about that a little bit. So where we're at right now, you know, Jay Billis wrote a great article not too long ago about, you know, players being employees of the university. Right. And then we're at right now in February, 2024, Dartmouth, their basketball team's trying to unionize. Right. So a lot of stuff's going to happen, but you know, there are a few places that, you can do NIL deals. One of them is the military academies, like Air Force Academy, where I played, and then the Ivy League. And the Ivy League, which we've discussed, Tom, is you know you might be a student uh, getting financial aid, and if you get $100,000 in an NIL deal, well, now you might not qualify for financial aid anymore. And the Ivy League, is, as smart as that conference is, as wealthy as the alumni network is, I haven't seen any action therein to get creative with this, which surprised me because I thought if anyone would be at the forefront – it would be the Ivy League trying to figure out a way to get around this. Do, do you have any insight on the Ivies or any thoughts on how they could do it potentially? Uh, I don't. I actually learned about uh, okay. learned a lot about that, uh, the inner workings of that from you, actually, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking in regards to that financial aid situation. And, and obviously, that's such a um, esteemed, you know, beneficial uh, group of universities to attend. And so it does put the athlete in a spot where, well, you know, you're also attending Harvard, you're also attending Cornell or whatever it might be. And so the, there is a, a give and take there. And I, I don't, you know, I, I don't have much of an opinion on that other than that is a very valuable education that you can receive there and a very valuable network of people that you can be involved with there that actually might be more beneficial, more valuable than uh, what the current rates of NIL deals might be. Um, that would be, you know, uh, we don't have any athletes that we represent at this point or that we help with or any schools that we um, consult with in the Ivy Leagues. Um, but there were some great points that you raised, especially in regards to financial aid and the benefit. And so um, and, and a broader topic on this is that, you know, these NIL deals, um, you see athletes that get large nil deals you see some with mid-size and by large i mean you know six figures multiple six figures um you'll see some that are in the you know a, a middle of the road deal that might be ten thousand dollars or more then you have them that are ten thousand dollars or less uh, a majority overwhelming overwhelming majority of the deals are ten thousand dollars or less um because again it's it's kind of moved on where businesses want to see an roi on what they're doing and so they're evaluating these deals instead of just throwing a ton of cash at it they're actually looking at players um, and their ability to market their product more than just let me just throw a ton of money at it um, just to get this athlete to come to our school. Those are, are few and far between. The majority of the people that will be listening to this podcast, um, and you know, I'm sure we'll get to this at some point, but nothing has changed where you should still go where the coach has the best vision for you over the course of your um, over the course of, of your playing career there. Um, you want to make sure you love the campus, the education, all those different things. Um, for an overwhelming majority of players, um, you should still focus on those things other than uh, where can I go that will give me the largest NIL potential. Right. That's valuable you say that, right? Right fit. The, um, so to, back to the Ivy League specific, um, again, considering that what I just said in regards to most of the deals are not going to amount to the financial aid um, that they would receive to be able to go to those universities. It's still right fit. It's still what you want your future to look like. Most people are not going to play in the pros, play professionally. And so taking all that into account, um, even at the Ivy Leagues. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You know, it's uh, bird and ham uh, two in the bush because, uh, yeah, the benefits you're going to get with that network at Harvard, having that degree or any of the Ivy Leagues That's could right. trump even six-figure deal you might get playing, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, same for an academy as well. So if you're a college player, Tom, can you get deals on your own or should you hire an agent? And, you know, certain kids can get deals on their own, but who should hire an agent? Like what kind of player, what kind of money, what kind of profile? Walk me through that. Okay. Um, so the businesses 
um, that our sales team encounter and talk with on a daily basis, um, the first things that they want to know are what are the athletes' social media media following? It's mainly centered around TikTok and Instagram and Twitter or X. Um, what those followings are, and then beyond the followings, you know, what are their weekly impressions? Um, and so, if you're an athlete that has, you know, over twenty-five to thirty thousand followers on Instagram, um, you know, fifty thousand or more on TikTok you're going to be right on that border where a business will give you some nice deals. Um, you know, we have a, but when it comes to needing to go hire an agent, um, if you're up around the, if, if you're in six figures and followers um, on all the different platforms or at least on Instagram and, and TikTok, it would be worth your time and it would be worth that agency's time to go out and shop deals for you at that point. Because most agencies will take on athletes and maybe will try, but um, th to go find deals and shop deals for the athlete. But unless your social media following is at a certain level, you're just not going to be prioritized um, at the level that somebody would, you know, we, we have a, a young lady soccer player um, at a certain university that we help with that has 600,000 TikTok followers. And she's done a good job with that. And she is a good soccer player. Um, but what is more important to those companies is obviously that she has 600,000 TikTok followers. And so th with those types of numbers, um, you know, we're talking those mid tier deals. So it, it likely will be nothing but $10,000 and above type of deals, um, 20,000, $25,000 deals, because again, the, the marketing spend, uh, would be worth it for these different corporations. And so it, those are the types of people that should really be focused on the uh, on the agency side. If you're not serious about growing your brand um, via social media um, through different things that you can do to grow that brand, um, I wouldn't recommend reaching out to an agent. You can, but I don't. You won't get anything from it. Let's say you've got those that followers, like you mentioned, twenty five thousand and above. How would you go about finding an agent? So at that point, I mean, it's, that's, that is more difficult to do. Now we're available at athlete advantage, um, obviously. Um, and we, we actually specialize in this, um, other agencies, your traditional agencies, such as, uh, CAA and Wasserman and these other agencies, um, they have been taking on college athletes as well. Um, I don't want to speak, I, I don't know their business model that well, but I, I believe a lot of it has to do with uh, what your pro career could be afterwards as well, um, where they try to go after somebody. But um, <clears throat> marketing agencies is what you'd look for. You it, So you could jump online and try to Google different marketing agencies. Um, if you do have those level of following, uh, that level of following, um, Athlete Advantage, our company is very specific in the NIL space where other marketing agencies, you know, market for businesses and do a lot of different other things. Um, and we've had quite a bit of success in finding NIL deals, but um, you would be looking for a marketing agent is what you would be looking for. If anybody would okay. want to jump on and try to Google those different things, that specifically is what you look for. Talk to me about Reed Shepard at UK. He's blown up this year. We talked about him a year and a half ago when he was still in high school. He's blown up top freshman in the country. He's electrifying. Um, he's must see TV for me and a lot of people talk to me about his markability. If he decides to come back to UK for a second year and we're talking hypothetically here, like you're his agent, like, can you capitalize on this? And if so, how, um, so you were saying, you know, if we were his agent, um, so first and foremost, uh, I, th I probably said this the last time that we talked, but, um, an amazing young man, human being, great family, um, and has just done such a great job for a long time now, actually, um, even though he's young and just a freshman, he's been in the spotlight, at least in Kentucky, and and then through his sophomore, junior, and senior years nationally, blowing up on the national scene, he's just done an amazing job at, um, w with his brand um, and who he is as a person and, and that genuine nature coming through. Um, I being from Kentucky and listening to the chatter and having a bunch of UK um, fans as friends. Um, I would say that it wouldn't be hard to get everybody to chip in something 
to come up with a major deal to bring him back. I, I think they could that, that a campaign could be wrapped around Reed and uh, and he can make a significant amount of money to come back because he's done such an amazing job again endearing himself um, to this fan base and then leaving it all out there on the court. Um, it's what obviously what fans want to see, UK fans specifically um, want to see in regards to his effort, his passion. Um, his skill set, the way he plays, just the total package. Um, but I would say that his uh, his NIL potential, um, if he were to return, um, would be <clears throat> would be significant. It, it would be among the highest players uh, in the country in college basketball. Let me ask you a theory here. This is just I just thought of this. Like, could you almost do a telethon and say, "Hey, everyone in Kentucky." Uh, donate ten dollars if you want Reed to come back, and that money could just go into a pot. And mind you, if he doesn't come back, everyone gets refunded. But like, yeah, that's in theory you could do that these days, right? In, in theory, in theory, you could do that. In theory, you could do that. Now there would obviously, at the end of the day, um, there has to be a quid pro quo. Okay, quid pro so quo, you can't yeah. just you can't just give athletes money. So there would have to be something, some sort of exchange in goods that uh, uh, that Reed would have to do at that point, but. Um, in that scenario, I, I think that, that it would absolutely blow up and, and that would be, a, that would be a very successful telethon campaign, uh, to get him to come back. Yeah. Well, for 50 bucks, you get an autographed picture. Is that considered a quid pro quo? It is. It is correct. It could be something as, as simple as an autograph picture or just, a, or even just an autograph on a piece of paper. Um, so yeah. that's, I mean, we want what's best for Reed. He's going to have to do his own thing, but you know, I'm just thinking oh, yeah. outside the box here. Like if he was weighing it and money was an issue, like Kentucky's a pretty creative place. I'm just curious, like how they would utilize that. Correct. He, he has very smart people around him, um, that have their priorities in line and there's, there's no doubt about it. I, I really believe that he will make a great decision and he's going to be very successful, um, in, in whatever he does, he, he's, I can't say, speak highly enough about him and the people that he has around him, his parents and the different people. They're, they're going to make the right decision. And they just, uh, you know, it, it's obvious that they love UK. It's obvious that Reed loves UK. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how all that plays out. But he does, I'll reiterate, he does have the potential, I believe, if he came back to be, um, to earn as much or more than anybody, any athlete, any player in the country. Yeah, have I ever told you my Jeff Shepard story from 1991? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, the Booster Club at Henry Clay High School, the first high school I played at, um, my dad was on it, and we decided to bring Jeff Shepard's Macintosh High School team up from Atlanta suburbs to play Henry Clay in Memorial Coliseum. And uh, Jeff had already signed to Kentucky, so it's going to be a money making opportunity and for a chance for the fans to see Jeff in action for the first time because there's no YouTube back then. So sold out, and I'm somehow the team host as a freshman, right? Like I get to hang out with the Macintosh team all day. And that night back in the hotel after the game, I had to show them like, you know, channel 18, channel 27, channel 36, like flipping through showing the highlights, and it was the lead story. And Jeff and the rest of the guys could not believe they made every news channel because in Atlanta, no one talked about them on the sports channel there. But here it was the top story. And uh, so I remember Jeff was like a, a kid, Watching that, he didn't say anything, right? He was, you know, yeah. he's he's pretty stoic, um, yes. stoic guy. But uh, it was just fun to like be there behind the scenes on how everyone, uh, the rest of his teammates, were just could not believe like the coverage they were getting. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I've had the the good fortune of being around uh, Jeff since Reed was in first grade, um, playing in our state tournaments that we would host here for their AAU teams, and um, I, I remember, of course, the first time meeting him, you know, growing up in Kentucky, um, I, it was a big deal. Um, the, the, you know, the first time that I was meeting, I, I was, I, I even checked the coach's name twice and be like, Jeff Shepard is coaching. Is that, is that the, the Jeff it has to be the Jeff and, uh, the humility, um, that he showed and the, um, the understanding, obviously, <laughs> you know, when you're doing a, a lot of games, a lot of, uh, travel team, AAU style games, you're going to have fun. Uh, referee situations. You're going to have fun team situations about different opponents and different things. And fun. I learned very, yeah. very early on um, that that there's it is possible um, to be very competitive, try as hard as you can, and want to win every game and every possession. Yet at the same time, because of your priorities, 
um, keep a perspective um, on things that were going around. And a lot of that I learned um, early on in my career running um, basketball events from Jeff and watching Jeff because he's such a high profile person to me at the time. Um, I really paid attention to that. And so um, I can tell and from an early age, I learned that about Reed as well, that that was really passed on from Jeff and Stacy. And that's why I, I've seen him in some adverse situations that a lot of people um, would have handled a lot differently and even probably would have been justified to handle differently. Um, but he didn't. And that made a profound impact on my life in regards to standards and priorities and keeping everything in priority. And even with him um, reacting to situations that way, you see the success um, that not only they've had, but that Reed has had by taking that, <clears throat> by taking that same approach um, mm -hmm. as he plays and how he deals with things. And so um, again, Reed and the, and the entire, that entire family um, has had a massive impact on my life and uh, so excited to see uh, how well he's doing at the next level. Yeah, and I, and I, I, predict that we'll see that. I predict we'll see that in the NBA as well. Um, uh, I think he'll do a. I think he'll be a, a key part. I've got some kind of player comparisons in my head, possibly, but um, I think he's going to do really well. Well, that's great. Thanks for sharing that story. All right, if you're getting recruited, if you're a high school player getting recruited by a college coach, do you, should you bring up NIL at all? And if you do, what questions should you be asking? Okay. Um, First and foremost, I would, given the landscape of everything that's going on, um, I'm going to say, yes, you should bring that up, but I'm going to say that that is not the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth thing that you bring up. Um, nothing has changed, and Corey, you, you and I have always clicked, connected, and seen eye to eye on this stuff. Um, it's got to be about the right fit, wherever you go. It's got it's to be about the right fit, based on what your goals are as a player. Um but after you talk about the coach's vision for you at that university over the course of four years, um, or in some cases five, um, after all of that is settled and you have a comfort level with that, then I do, I do not think it would be off-putting to ask about um, what NIL experiences their players have or what opportunities may be there at that university just for your own edification as to what you're walking into um what we're seeing is a lot of players are a lot of a lot of athletes and m to be honest most of the time it's the people around them are leading with that question and that is setting up a relationship that's not healthy for either side um i alluded to this earlier more of a mercenary type of relationship um and that has not shown to be successful at high level college athletics the last couple of years. Um, I won't throw out actual school or program names, but, but there has uh, been some that have gone all in on that kind of approach. And it's becoming very difficult from a coach's perspective and administration perspective to maintain the respect, the team camaraderie, um, all the things that you can't get away from to win. Um, you and I, again, we, we see the world the same way when it comes to what it takes to win. Um, and at the end of the day, the NIL stuff is, is great. It's fantastic. It's been needed and necessary, but the universities and the fans and the donors and the businesses and everybody and should, and the athletes should be included on that, but they all still want to win. And so I would recommend that after all the questions have been asked in regards to fit and the coach's vision for you at that university, um, I don't think it's um, in today's landscape, it wouldn't be a shock and it wouldn't be offensive to ask about um, have players done NIL deals there and what um, what their NIL um, plans are and how the university deals with name, image and likeness um, at that university. Do not leave. It's with got me question. thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you seen or heard about like locker room issues between like a guy that gets paid a lot but he's not performing as much as the guy getting paid less. Like, is that happening in college locker rooms with the NIL deals? It is. Yeah, it is. And, and, I, and I won't say it's prevalent or that's some type of like, you know, overarching thing that's going on, but, but absolutely it's happening. Um, and, you know, I, I've been made aware of different situations where, you know, there are players, let's say on a football field um, in October that already know 
where they're going next, you know, because of different things, just being checked out, you know, and, and um, nobody would ever know it, you would think, but uh, there's that, there is what you just described where, um, you know, athletes will, uh, you know, compare themselves and compare that value and all that stuff. Um, but I won't say it's prevalent. Have I heard those stories? Yes. But it's not like it's something that comes across my desk or my phone rings about it every day. So I'm not trying to paint a picture of that it's just devastating out there right now because it's really not. And something that you and I have discussed, um, and I, I know this to be true, is that an overwhelming majority of the NIL deals in the NIL activity that is going on um, is positive. It's actually very positive and in many cases absolutely life-changing for a lot of families. Um, and some of those stories have been really touching, very motivational as to what's going on. Um, unfortunately, a lot of what we see, whether it be on the news or whatever it might be, are, are, they tend to lean towards the negative stories. And so um, conservatively, I would say that 95% of everything that goes on with NIL is very positive, life-changing um, for these families. Other athletes that are on those teams don't care in a negative way. They're actually happy for the other person. That is an overwhelming majority of what's going on. Um, unfortunately, again, as I mentioned, our uh, media sometimes will tend to lean towards the negative to make it seem as though this is a train wreck and this isn't going well and it's tension and it's, uh, you know, all those types of things, because that's kind of what sells on the media side. All right. Can high school players or prep school players currently take advantage of NIL deals or sponsorships or get agents? They can in many states. Yes. Um, so if you're at a prep school or some sort of situation where your school is not a member of the state association, then that the answer is always yes. Um, but in many states, um, and th this is readily available on Google, um, but in many states now, um, high schoolers are able to do um, NIL deals. They go by the same standards. They're supposed to go by the same standards and rules of which go on at the university. There does have to be a quid pro quo. It can't, <clears throat> it can't be used as an inducement to get an athlete to go from you know, one school to another or to go to a school. Um, but yes, in, in most cases around the country, and I, I'm sorry I don't have that readily available for you, but in most states around the country, um, high school athletes um, and prep school athletes can uh, participate in, in, in IL. But Tom, there's no compliance office to check over these deals. So really it's between the family and a business, right? It is. It is. Um, I would absolutely recommend to anybody, though, to keep their athletics director in the loop um, as to what's going on, just to keep everything. It, one of the things that this new NIL um, landscape has done is it's taken the old way of doing things. And we've heard those stories for 50 years in regards to potentially paying people under the table and, um, you know, uh, paper bags full of cash and just, you know, different stuff like that. Um, tax issues, all the old ways. Um, those are, those are not necessary anymore. Everything can be done out in the open. And that's what we're a proponent of is there's no need to hide. Everything can be done legally. Everything can be done, um, through compliance. And that's really one of the benefits that's going on here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I would keep the athletics director in the loop if possible. Um, and, and just make sure that everything's way above board. There's no need to hide anything anymore. Um, we're still, as I mentioned earlier, when we're in this kind of infancy to toddler stage, part of that is that I do think that there's still, um, a sense of people being uncomfortable with the whole process because we're just coming out of the old ways of doing things. And any time that player getting paid is in the same sentence, it's uh, don't say that too loud. You know, let's keep that very quiet. Yeah. Let's, you know, that we've got to keep that hidden. And so part of this transition from the old way to the new way is really understanding that it's, it's okay now. And it's actually a great thing and it's impacting families lives. And it's a win-win situation where the business that is, doing this NIL deal with the athlete wants the ROI and on their marketing spend. And so it's a win for them and it's a win for everybody that's involved. And so there does need to be a shift in the way that people look at this um, because nobody's doing anything wrong at this point. And I, I really believe that 
it'll probably be in the next two to three years. Um, but definitely when you look 10 years down the road, that um, there, that shift will be complete and that everybody will be way more comfortable with what's going on. We're just in that initial phase right now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, two members of the Prep Athletics family actually are playing D1 now and have their own stores. Jamison Smith at Rhode Island. He's a freshman. Uh, he did a post year at Wilbraham and Monson, and he's got his Rhode Island store set up. I actually bought a T-shirt from him. And then a kid we coached back in Kentucky, Trey King, um, yeah. is a prep athletics uh, alum who went to Hargrave and is now at Iowa State. He's got a store set up too. And I've purchased items from both stores because I'd love to support these kids. But a lot of my other kids I reach out to that are currently playing D1 or D2 do not have any NIL deals. They don't have any stores set up. So – my question to you, Tom, is how easy is it for just any college athlete out there to set up uh, an online store that can sell gear with their with their name, image, and likeness on it? So, I mean, there are various websites that will do that. A lot of times, it has to be set up for you know with a fee. Um, we um, have a partnership with a with a really large corporation that does this as well, called Team IP, um, and that's a service that we offer um, to different athletes as well. Um, it can be, it can be relatively simple. Um, but you would just need to reach out to a clothing manufacturer and, and a lot of them, again, if you throw, if you know, Google, what a, what a tool. Um, but it, but with, I think a simple search, you can find out what's going on. Sometimes there is a, there's a setup fee. Um, but a lot of times, um, you're able to pick out the different merchandise that you would like to have, um, your, whether it be a picture or a logo of you or your name and number on the back, um, you can go through and set those sorts of things up at, at a lot of universities too. They do have partnerships um, where athletes are able to use the um, IP, the logos of the university as well. If that's something that you're looking to do, then you would need to contact your athletics department um, because anything that has to do with using the logos of that university will have to be approved um, by the university and their multimedia rights partner. Um, so it really depends at, at Rhode Island or at Iowa state. Um, you could go directly to that at a lot of the D two and D three schools. I would say that that would just be a simple conversation with the athletics director to figure out, um, what the uses of those marks could be, if you're able to use them or not on your gear. Um, and then contacting the provider again for any of this stuff, any of your listeners, they can always reach out to us at, um, athleteadvantage.com. Um, and we can help walk through those different things with those athletes, whether they end up doing something with us or not. All right. And let's assume they sell a t-shirt for $20. What percentage should a kid be looking to make off of a t-shirt? Just on average. Okay. On average, um, to me, if, if uh, it, it should at least be, at least be 10%, at least, um, in regards to, and, and in that scenario, the athlete is actually doing nothing. So there are scenarios okay. where you can make 50% or whatnot, but in those scenarios, most of the time, the athlete has to pre-purchase a lot of the items um, ahead of time. So now there's an investment into what's going on. Um, there are deals out there, and, and again, I won't throw out names, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, there's a major corporation um, that's partnered with some major universities and different people around there. And the athlete is receiving 4%. And, you know, I guess they would justify that by saying that they're doing the marketing because they have a really massive brand and that the athlete has no cost involved. Um, but that's, that's one area that we're looking to, you know, that, that we've been expanding into because we have a much better deal with that. And to the manufacturer's credit, there is, time, effort, and money involved in setting this up on behalf of the athletes. And also a commitment to, you might put in all that time, effort, and energy, and money, and the athlete might not move one piece of clothing, but yet you've spent the money. And so the risk really is, um, in most scenarios, on the company and not on the athlete. Um, but again, there are, uh, there's even if somebody wants to, they can just start their own website buy a bunch of t-shirts and hoodies, have them printed themselves and hope that they sell. And then you can keep a hundred percent of it if you want. And so it's just on a sliding scale of what the athlete wants to do. One of the things that we're really big on and, and what our company helps with 
is the athlete not losing focus of their actual priorities, which are taking care of the classroom. Um, and then after that, taking care of the court, you know, what's on the court or on the field. Um, cause there has been those distractions. Um, and with those distractions, um, you know, things slip and there, and it doesn't, the money that the athlete might be chasing after focusing on, let's use it as an example, selling their merchandise is actually, if you were giving them great guidance and mentorship, it's not worth the time that they're taking away from the court or from the, more importantly, the academics, the classroom. Um, and so there's gotta be a perspective there that's healthy. Um, again, nobody's more pro athletes making money than, than myself or our team. Um, at the same time, there's a mentorship thing to this uh, where you've got to be realistic and know where you are um, and know what's what, where your priority should actually be. Yeah, I love that. I love that you keep coming back to that because that's so important, Tom. Uh, in five years from now, if you've got a crystal ball, what's the best case scenario for NIL and what's the worst case scenario? Yeah, so I would say that the... I would say that the best case scenario is that all the parties that are involved that I mentioned early on, which were the businesses, the athletes and the universities. And when I say the universities, I also include their multimedia rights partners um, that help them. The best case scenario is that everybody has found a way um, to work together um, to to where everybody can win. There are scenarios out there where everybody can win. What's tough and what could lend towards the worst case scenario is um, if the athletes or the universities and the MMR partners or the businesses, if, if they decide that they want to win way more than everybody else, or if they want to, uh, if anybody wants to gatekeep to a certain uh, degree, and, and you and I've discussed this, I, where I've seen it kind of like a pendulum, um, where for the longest time, the pendulum was swung. And, and again, we can debate on, um, the value that I actually believe in, in regards to a scholarship and paying for athletes, you know, all their expenses and their food and their experience, the way it, the way it used to be um, when they couldn't earn off their name, image, and likeness. But I still would consider that the pendulum being swung um, towards the university's favor because the athletes didn't have the opportunity to earn like other students did. Um, what we can't see is the pendulum to swing all the way over to the athletes that's not going to be healthy as well. Um, and so there is a middle ground where everybody's working together um, and there are solutions for this, but um, it's, it's, re it's really hard to predict. Right now, um, if you ask me today, um, I am very positive on everybody coming together for win-win situations because there's so many advocates at the table for each entity that's involved in, in the NIL process. And I would be very positive. You could call me a week from now and I could say, Ooh, it, it looks like um, the athletes are trying to push too much for the pendulum to be on their side or um, the same people that have been gatekeeping the athletes for making money want to continue to gatekeep and they're going to try to legislate it to where they are still in control of what the athletes can make. And so, in that scenario, there's some progress because the athletes are earning, but there might be some caps or limitations or different things that might come into play um, if the original gatekeepers are allowed to continue to gatekeep. And so it's really on a day by day, week by week basis in regards to what my crystal ball um, could be. But I am I am positive that there's enough advocates at the table on each side that eventually there will be a win win situation. Gotcha. Um, last thing, is there anything you want to touch on that we have not discussed during this conversation? Um, so just a general discussion in regards to NIL, and I have, I have hit on this, but um, for most athletes, uh, it's not just the star player uh, that's on the court that can receive the NIL deals. Um, Working on your personal brand and taking that seriously, um, again, properly prioritized after your work on school and after your work on, um, you know, on your craft, on your sports, um, 
I would recommend that athletes that are serious that would like to do uh, participate in NIL deals while they're in college or even maybe while they're still in high school, instead of playing Fortnite for four hours at night um, or throughout the day or uh, whatever the other distractions may be, if you're serious about this, I would recommend that they build their brand. Um, and the types of brands that businesses want to um, invest in and want to partner with are going to be the brands of the student athletes that um, show that they care about the community. They care about um, the fans. So think about it from a business's standpoint. Why would they use a college athlete from the local university to market to their customers? What they're banking on is that the customers will be invested enough into that fan. Or I'm sorry, the customers, yes, the customers will be, will be invested enough into that athlete that they will say, wow, thank you, business. I love that athlete, too. I'm going to go shop at your business. And so an athlete building a brand that shows that they care about people and they're not just making it about themselves. Look at me. Look at me. Um, this can be done through community service work. This can be done through just what you talk about and what you post, being very mindful about what you post to where it doesn't turn off people. Um, but the better that you can build your brand into something that businesses would want to partner with, the more success that you'll have. And it doesn't matter if you are the, you know, the, the third string or a walk on or whatever it might be, because the businesses care about mainly, um, their ROI on the marketing dollar through what you can do via social media. And so if you want to take this serious, um, become a person that a business would want to brand with and really dive into what, why would a business want to co-brand with somebody? Take a look at those, those factors and those reasons why, because that athlete is now going to be an extension of that business. And that's been some hesitation on businesses to jump into NIL right now is because, well, these are young people. And what if I attach my business to a young person that goes out and makes a young person mistake? Now that mistake is rubbed off on my business and people will associate that mistake with my business. And so being a strong character and being a safe bet for businesses um, through your branding, mainly that you do on your social media, is going to open up a lot of opportunities on the NIL side. And how do people do that? How do people quickly, how, just, this is yeah. snapshots and this is books written on this. How would a, a, a student athlete who's in high school now build their brand? Well, I, I just mentioned something I think is very low hanging fruit. fruit. Um, get out in your community and serve. That is something okay. that for me, um, and and you know it's tough because you want to serve genuinely and really without ulterior motives. Um, but I also think of win win situations, and so um, promoting different, whether it be nonprofits, charities, different things that somebody would get out and serve, um, and building that as your brand. I think. Um, it's okay to post about that stuff. It, it really is okay um, because you also are serving at that time and making an impact. Um, anything that, and frankly, the young people that might be listening to this would maybe have better ideas than I do. I, I classify everything as serve, um, but there's a thousand different ways that you can serve. Um, you can show up at a gym, you can work a camp, you can you know, do all these different things that again, show that you are, um, trying to boost the community and that you're an upstanding member of the community to where a business is likely, um, they feel safe about investing with you for an NIL deal. Um, and, and I will be quick with this, Corey, but you and I, again, have always connected on the fact that um, the tool of sports is so incredibly valuable, not because everybody's going to go pro, but just because of the lessons that you learn along the way. And what I believe is that NIL is actually an added tool to sports as a whole, um, because now a player or an athlete has even more reason to make good grades, to be an upstanding citizen, to serve. It, it, besides just staying on the court, it's now, well, if you do these things, you can also make some money doing it as well through businesses <clears throat> branding with you. Love it. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Tom, where can people find you and your company? Yeah, um, athleteadvantage.com. And you can search us for on all the different social medias, um, uh, X, Twitter, um, Instagram. But it's, it's athleteadvantage and athleteadvantage.com. And we're here to, you know, to help athletes with anything. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for coming on again and sharing yeah. what I think is valuable information for today's you know, high school student athlete and college student athletes. 
and their families. And I'm sure we'll have you on in a year and a half when things change or update again. So this is a, this is a constant moving target. But um, So thanks so much for joining us, Tom. If you like this conversation and others, be sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms, whichever one's your choice, and go to the YouTube channel where we got bonus content on there. And if you have any questions about prep schools or NIL, you can reach out to me. Just go to the prepathletics.com website or reach to Tom, reach out to Tom, whose contact information will be in the show notes below. This podcast would not be here without Mr. Tom Bowers, uh, you know, help in getting me getting it started. So I want to thank you again, Tom, for that inspiration. We're close to 100 episodes now, and uh, it's been just a pure joy. I've learned so much and had a blast with it. So it's always good to have you on again. And mind you, I just remember this is your third time on, not second. So welcome back. Uh, I'm really spent. <laughs> thank you, Corey. Thank you for your friendship and everything you do for everybody. I really appreciate that as well. All right. See you guys next week.